so I'm like looking down. Um, yeah, as Katie said, uh, I'm an independent arborist. I work for myself. Uh, my company is called Emergent Tree Works, and I mostly work as a contract climber around Fort Wayne. Uh, I don't claim to be any sort of expert or authority on tree safety in the tree care industry. I'm just going to talk to you as one climber to a bunch of climbers. Um, so Brian asked me to talk a little bit about how our workplace safety is affected by new uh, climbing techniques. Um, I've been doing tree work for a little over 11 years as a climbing arborist, and in that time I've seen huge changes in the way that we go about our work. Um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things, the biggest thing that comes to mind is a single rope technique for ascent, which I got into pretty early after I started climbing, and then uh, also more recently for work positioning in the tree. That's something that I use every day, a lot of other arborists use that every single day, that was almost unheard of uh, a few years ago. So real quick, can I get a show of hands? Uh, who here, when they're climbing, regularly uses SRT for ascent into the tree? Cool, that's, that's probably over 75%. And then who here regularly uses SRT for uh, work positioning, moving around and doing work in the tree? Show of hands. Cool, fewer, but still, that's a lot of people. So I just want to talk real quick about like how these techniques are impacting our workplace safety. Um, and when I first started looking at this, I wanted to like get some hard facts to present you guys with some numbers, some real like you know hard stuff that you can take home and say, oh, I haven't heard that before. And uh, as it turns out, that's that's really hard. <laughs> uh, if you go to government websites, you know this is one from England. Um, these are the types of things you get: uh, real general information about. Uh, how many different types of accidents that happen, no information about the context. If you're trying to understand something about the relative safety of different techniques, this is basically useless. Uh, but you know, statistics, even really vague statistics, statistics can be super misleading. Uh, as James said, you know, perhaps a majority of the workplace uh, injuries that we have don't even get reported. So this is a good example of a how statistic can really lead you astray. You see in this, we have the number of fatal work injuries. It takes a huge dive around 2008, 2009. Do we, do we all of a sudden get like really safe? <laughs> or did the economy tank and people weren't working as much, right? And, and if you're wondering if that's just from fewer workers, they actually did a different graph which shows uh, fatalities per hour worked and uh, the graph looks about the same. So it's not just the number of workers, it's also the workers had fewer incidents. The most relevant um, site for you know injuries and statistics on injuries for our industry comes from TCIA. Um, if you want to learn about you know falls from trees, uh, why they happen, what the, what the specific circumstances are, uh, they have. I think it's it's like 130. They have well over 100 uh, accident reports that involve specific uh, circumstances of falls from trees. These are just professionals, and these are just the fatal falls. So if you want to get really depressed and scared, sometimes you can go through that. Um, so I went through that, you know, thinking maybe we'll have some information on. Uh, advanced climbing techniques, something like that. And I quickly realized, first off, you're not gonna find that stuff uh, in great enough numbers to learn anything about it. And even if you do, you know, if you have one here, one there, trying to draw any sort of conclusion from that is really problematic, right? That's a, a huge fallacy to say that we, oh, we found a few here that involve this one piece of gear that means that it's dangerous. Or the converse, that if we don't find those accidents, that therefore it's safe, right? How many times when you ask somebody if what they're doing, the technique that they're using is safe, do they say, oh, it's totally safe. I've been doing this for years. I haven't had any problems, yeah. right? That's all the time. That's nuts. That's, that's, that doesn't mean anything. That's a total cognitive uh, fallacy. It means it's something that sounds right that is obviously wrong on a little bit of examination. So, Let's talk real quick about sort of why we adopt new techniques. I think probably everybody uh, started doing SRT or started getting into more advanced climbing 
jogging techniques, probably from something like this, right? You see like some picture of somebody effortlessly jugging up a line into a huge tree and you think, that's, that's for me, that's what I want to do. I don't want to be that guy that's like, you know, endlessly pulling the rope and exhausted by the time I get to the top of the tree. I want to be this guy that's just gliding up on a, on a single rope. So, um, you know, we all get into this with the idea that we're going to make our life easier and safer. But, you know, does it pay to be an early adopter? Does it pay to be on the bleeding edge uh, with tree climbing techniques? Here's two good things that we can talk about. On the left, I have the, uh, um, the spec sheet, the user manual for the rope runner. Now, this is a, a tool that some of you are probably familiar with. It's made by Singing Tree uh, in Michigan. Uh, this is a single rope uh, work positioning device. Um, you know, this, this device has been fairly controversial with a lot of gear manufacturers. Uh, a lot of people question how much testing it's gone through when it came out. Uh, and, and, you know, just looking again through the, the manual this morning, I was kind of shocked at how long the list of don'ts was, the, the number of different diagrams that have that skull. That's just one page, but there's like four other pages that have all these different things that you don't want to do with that. Um, you know, even a, a fairly well-known gear manufacturer, who I, I won't name, so I don't want to name names, that's not the point, but, you know, he told me that he thought it was unconscionable that they were selling this to that's some people's opinion. Um, on the right, we have the spec sheet for the Petzl Zigzag. This is a really different story. You know, this is a, a flagship product for one of the biggest gear manufacturers in the world that is legendary for their R&D department and uh, how meticulous they are about testing everything. Well, the first version of this came out and it had a really, really huge flaw that caused it to basically completely break apart under <coughs> relatively <coughs> circumstances for a climber working in a tree. That's a huge deal. They had to recall it. Then they put out a second version, which uh, has still been having quite a few problems. So I guess the, the, the point that I want to make in this is, does it pay to be an early adopter? If you're talking about brand new gear, gear that's life support, does it pay to be on that bleeding edge to get that thing the minute it comes out? Maybe not. You're paying a premium, and uh, uh, you're paying a premium, you know, in terms of how much money you're going to pay for it. But you also might be uh, sort of helping. Um, you might be doing their safety testing for them. Don't don't fool yourself into thinking <coughs> that it's an independent, unbiased entity somewhere that spent thousands of hours doing everything that they possibly can do to this device. That not exist. You're relying on the manufacturer. Uh, do you trust